Seven Facts About Demons That Many Do Not Know Number 1. They Are Personal Beings It is clear that demons have the attributes of personality. Both Christ and the demons themselves use the first-person pronouns I, me, and your when referring to one another. Luke chapter 8, verse 27 through 30, New International Version. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. The demonic spirit within the possessed man, not the man himself, was responsible for this. The demon didn't want to leave the body he was inhabiting. Demonic possession occurs when a demonic spirit resides in a human body and exhibits its own personality through the host body's personality. Demonic possession is a reality in today's world. Fortune-telling, supposedly harmless occult games and practices, spiritism, and other practices open the door to deception for believers and real demonic danger for unbelievers. People frequently become involved in the occult or demonic things because something there appears to work. Unfortunately, it is not something at work, but someone at work. A demonic spirit. We can say that demons want to occupy bodies for the same reason the desecrator wants a spray can. A body is a weapon they can use to attack God. Demons also attack men because they despise the image of God in man, so they try to mar that image by desecrating man and making him hideous. Demons have the identical purpose in Christians, which is to wreck the image of God, but their tactics are limited. In regard to Christians, Demonic spirits were disarmed by Jesus' work on the cross, though they can both trick Christians, binding them with unbelief. Colossians 2, chapter 15, Amplified Bible. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. The demons said, I beg you, do not torment me. This was an iconic comment because the man was constantly troubled by the demons, devastating him in body, mind, and soul. Yet he thought that Jesus might haunt him. Number 2. Personal Name Jesus asked the demon, What is your name? Luke chapter 8, verse 30 through 33. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he answered, Legion. Because many demons had entered him. They continually begged him not to command them to go into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the mountain. The demon begged Jesus to allow them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. What is your name? According to the traditions of Jewish exorcists of that time, one had to know the name of the demon to acquire authority over it, and deliver the demon-possessed person. But Jesus did not use the name learned in this interaction. He had power over demons far above current superstitions. Jesus most likely asked the name of the demon so that we could understand the full scope of the problem, knowing that man was filled with many demons, not just one. We should note that Legion is not a name. It was evasive, threatening, and intimidating. A Roman legion was typically made up of 6,000 men. Legion says, there are a lot of us. We are organized, we are unified, we are ready to fight, and we are mighty. Number 3. Speech. In communication, speech demonstrates personality. The demons conversed with Christ, and Christ spoke with the demons. They begged him not to send them into the abyss. The demons who inhabited this man did not want to be imprisoned in the abyss, which is the bottomless pit described in Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. It appears to be a place of confinement for certain demonic spirits. 
Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, Amplified Bible. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss, the bottomless pit. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, destruction, and in Greek, he is called Apollyon, destroyer king. Jesus accepted this because the time for the conclusive demonstration of his power over evil spirits had not yet arrived. That demonstration would take place on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 tells us that Jesus disarmed demons in their attacks on believers at the cross, made a public spectacle of their defeat, and prevailed over them in his work on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, Amplified Bible. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. The demons caused the herd of swine to act erratically, causing them to run wildly down the steep slope into the lake, where they eventually drowned. This demonstrated the destructive character of the spirits. They were just like their commander, Satan, whose goal is to steal, kill, and destroy everything in their path. John chapter 10, verse 10, Amplified Bible. The thief comes only in order to steal, and kill, and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life, and have it in abundance, to the full, till it overflows. Some believe this was unfair to the owner of the pigs, but the owners of the swine lost their property. Yes, and learn from this how small value temporal riches are in the estimation of God. Spurgeon made a number of insightful observations regarding the impact the devils had on the swine, including the following. Swine preferred death to devilry, and if men were not worse than swine, they would be of the same opinion. They run hard whom the devil drives. The devil drives his hogs to a bad market. Number four, will. Demons exercised will in appealing to Christ not to cast them into the abyss, but to permit them to enter swine. Christ's authority to them is essentially a demand of his will over theirs, an order they had to obey. Number five, intelligence. Demons were aware of the identity of the Lord Jesus. One of them acknowledged Paul and the ministry he was leading to a slave girl. The spirit also allowed her to determine confidential information through fortune telling or divination. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. And it happened that as we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, that is, a demonic spirit claiming to foretell the future and discover hidden knowledge, and she brought her owners a good profit by fortune-telling. She followed after Paul and us and kept screaming and shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for several days. Then Paul, being greatly annoyed and worn out, turned and said to the spirit inside her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, as his representative, to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. It is reported that the young woman possesses a spirit of divination, or a spirit by which she anticipated the future. Even in modern times, some try to make a living by predicting the future. Some of them are frauds, while others claim to use supernatural powers. This girl appears to have belonged in the latter category, though what she declared affirmed Paul's ministry he is troubled by it, which means to be strongly irked or provoked at something or someone. Why Paul delayed responding for a few days remains a mystery, but when he did attend to it, the power of God overcame the demonic hold over the girl's life. Number six, they are spirit beings. Demons are disembodied spirits. They are utterly devoid of any kind of material shape whatsoever. That nightfall, they brought many people who were possessed by demons before Jesus, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed everyone who was sick. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, Amplified Bible. When evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he cast out the evil spirits with a word, and restored to health all who were sick, exhibiting his authority as Messiah. Demons belong to the spirit world, and their only manifestation is the problems they cause. Number seven, some are eviler than others. 
The Bible speaks of grades of wickedness among the demons. Jesus said, Jesus was driving out a demon. When the demon left, the word of God tells us that. The crowd was amazed, but some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Luke chapter 11, verse 14 through 16. Others demanded a sign from heaven to validate his authority as if his miracles weren't sufficient. Jesus responded by pointing out the absurdity of their accusations. Satan would be working against himself if he expelled his own demons. The devil will be defeated one day, but not by his own defeat. He will fall at the hands of King Jesus. Furthermore, if Jesus was driving out spirits using Satan's power, how were the religious leaders' followers doing it? They couldn't convict Jesus without also condemning themselves. If, on the other hand, he casts out demons with the power of God's finger, he must be the Messiah who will bring his kingdom. Jesus declared himself to be the one with authority over Satan, the strong man. Though Satan had bound people, Jesus revealed his authority by conquering his evil forces, freeing captives, and dividing Satan's plunder. When it came to Jesus Christ, there can be no neutrality. He's either the Messiah or Satan, but he can't just be a teacher or a miracle worker. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Luke chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. When an unclean spirit leaves and returns to a person, Jesus explains what happens. When it discovers that its former home has been restored, it returns with a swarm of demons even eviler than itself. Then that person's current condition is worse than their previous one. To be free of demonic activity in one's life is not enough. The Holy Spirit must fill the void left by the emptiness. There is no such thing as a neutral position. We must not provide a welcoming environment for the demonic realm. The application of this parable is explicit in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, wherein Jesus likens the present generation, that is, the circumstance he addresses, to the man who has been exercised. He is warning that a situation confronted by his exercising presence is liable to be a worse state than before if there is no fundamental reform. Jesus teaches the peril of a barren life. The vacuum left by the departure of an evil spirit must be filled with the Holy Spirit or else the individual is open to worse demonic activity. The immediate application of the teaching is to those who lack the spiritual discernment to recognize Jesus as the Savior. In rejecting Him, they have nothing left but empty rites and ceremonies, making them even more susceptible to Satan's deception. Demons are messengers of the devil. They do the will of their master, Satan. Satan is called the head of the demons.